All right, creepy screen is up. That means it's time to party, relatively speaking. It's like, now playing laptop. Yeah, please, that's what I want you to play. Hang on. Let's see here. Hooray, I got it. Welcome back. Everyone's here. Full house yet again. Yay. No, I'm serious. Yay. I get this question repeatedly that, you know, well, do people actually come to your class since you show the video? I'm like, yes, they actually do. So thank you for actually coming. I appreciate it. So uh, homework four is in progress. Some of you are working on it. Aaron's been working on it. I saw it's going all right. Yep. Any questions on that I can start off with? It's not due until the 20th, so if you haven't started yet, no worries. My goal by the end of today is to have everything that you would need to do to be able to do it, so then uh, you can do most of it by now anyway. No? Okay, fair enough then. So I put up this picture to try and reorient us to what we've been talking about, fixed and random effects of time. Fixed, the part everybody gets. Random means everybody gets their own. So the picture on the top left would be an example of an empty means random intercept model. That's what it would predict. It says there's no change on average. That's indicated by the heavy black line. And that everybody, no changes the same. So that would look like. The model would be written like this one right here, where level one is the outcome for each occasion for each person predicted by an individual intercept placeholder. That intercept placeholder is predicted at level two by a fixed intercept plus a random intercept deviation. And then E is how far off your mean you are at each given occasion. So three parameters there. We then looked at fixed linear time random intercept. So that would be predicted by, that model would show this picture up in the top right. So now if I add a fixed effect of time that says on average, people can change in some linear way. It'll be nonlinear starting next week, but linear for now. But that that change is fixed, it's not random. That average slope holds equally well across people. So that model predicts parallel lines. That equation looked like this, where the key thing to point out is that we have a beta one placeholder for how each person should get their own effective time, but in the level two model, it's just defined by the constant, the constant mean average slope, the fixed linear slope. So everybody gets the same rate of time according to this model. The only source of individual differences at level two remains this random intercept. So people can start out differently but the model predicts that everybody changes the same. And therefore, if you look at these lines, parallel lines, implies constant variance over time. And although it's not obvious from the picture, constant covariance over time. Those words sound familiar? Give me a two word phrase that just says what I said. Compound symmetry, yes. I was pleased to look at your quizzes and see that everybody's got that one, so hooray. Constant variance over time, constant covariance over time is what a random intercept only model predicts. And I say only because it's in contrast to models that also have other kinds of random effects. All models are gonna have an E residual, so we don't have to mention that one. Likewise, all models have at least a fixed intercept, so we don't have to mention that one. So those are the two parameters that are given by default. The names of the models then describe what else is in there. So then we talked about significance and effect size. So do you remember how I would tell whether or not this gamma 1 0 fixed slope for everybody is significant? How do I tell? Aaron? If it's different than zero, the wall test, otherwise known as stare at the p-value that shows up on your output. Estimate divided by standard error is treated as a t with the given degrees of freedom, which we'll talk about later, how those come about, you get your p-value. And that is perfectly fine because fixed effects 
can be positive or negative. They're not bounded. So a null hypothesis of zero is a reasonable thing. How do I talk about effect size for my fixed linear slope? A new, new variant of variance accounted for starts with a P. I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it. You're right. Say it with authority. No, I swear I heard it. It's not just wishful thinking. What kind of new effect size talks about variance accounted for and it starts with the P, ends in an R square? There you go. Pseudo R square, yes. What makes pseudo R square different from regular R square? It can sometimes be negative. That's why they call it pseudo. Give me one more reason. Why didn't this ever come up in regression? How many kinds of residual variance do you have in a regression model? One. So how many possible R squares can you have? One. How many kinds of variance do I have in this model up here? Two. How many kinds of R square could I have? Two. So the idea of pseudo R square is that it is proportion reduction in each variance component. It's trying to distinguish how well the model does in predicting each type of variance, each pile of variance separately. So in the example that we did, we looked at pseudo R square for the fixed effect of time. In this case, is time a level one predictor or level two? Not a trick. Level one, yes. Therefore, should it account for level one residual variance or level two random intercept variance? Level one residual. So we looked at pseudo R square. In the example that we were doing, I believe it was 71% in the empty model of the variance was within persons at level one. And adding the fixed effect of time accounted for 69% of that 71%. So it's a little tricky, but think of it as a partition of a partition. You start out with your pie chart, you immediately cut it into between versus within, and then everything you're doing after that point has to be relative to one or the other. All right, I think that's about where we left off. Any questions so far? All right, I am going to do the slides in a slightly different order, I've decided. I'm skipping ahead to show you the random slope model on slide 19. We looked at this like a week ago. We didn't look at it last time, so we'll go back over it. So the difference here. We pick up this new variance term in the level two equation, U1. So now the way that each person gets their own linear slope is part fixed, part random. And random is always how far off you are from the fixed slope. So that describes the slope deviation that gives someone a more steep or less steep slope relative to the average slope. So when you put them together in this composite model at the bottom, you'll note that what we've actually added is an interaction term between a random effect and an observed variable. That one's for you, Lou. She asked me that at the, at the conference we were just at, that's how this was described, was an interaction between a latent variable and an observed variable. And she's like, I'm like, no, you know what that is. This is another way of talking about it. A random effect is a latent variable. It's unobserved. We don't know what each person's U1 is, nor do we need to know. U1 is there to convey the idea that what we're going to estimate is a variance across the slopes across people. We also then allow one more term that doesn't show up in the equations, which is a covariance between each person's intercept and each person's slope. So the random intercepts and random slopes get a covariance in the G matrix. So we did this picture before, but it bears repeating. 
slide 20. If the black line for the sample is the mean, the blue line is for one person. Note that I've centered time so that zero is the first occasion here. The fixed intercept gamma zero zero gives me the expected outcome at time zero on average. So that's the end of the line here. It's not exactly the time zero mean, but it's what the model says it should be by drawing a line through the means. This blue person here starts out lower than everybody else on average. So their U0 intercept deviation would be negative, giving them a minus four, getting them down to the six that the model thinks that they should have. The slope for the sample, rise over run, gamma one O is the fixed slope that everybody gets. That's six in this example. My blue person is growing more positively by two. So their random slope is a plus two. Add them together to get their total slope of eight. And then even after giving each person their own intercept and slope, so long as there's at least three occasions, E is then separately identified as the level one residual variance for how far off the predicted line each outcome is at each occasion. So each person would have four E's in this example. This E would be negative, this one would be positive, this one would be close to zero, and this one would be negative as well. All right. With me so far? Okay, so you don't typically provide the random effects for people. You don't ever need to have them. They just sit in the model as another pile of variance. So if I were estimating this model, I would now have three different kinds of variation. I still have residual variance, which is the deviation from predicted change at each occasion. Why are you off your line today? The only kind of predictors that can capture that are day time specific things. I then now have two kinds of between variation. Between person differences in the intercept, which we had before, that allows a different Y starting point for each person but also between person differences in the slope. So that one is tricky because the time slope is a level one variable. What we are saying is that that level one effect varies over level two people. That level one effect varies over level two people. Each person needs a different slope deviation to get them away from that mean slope. This is called a random linear time model because of the hierarchy that's involved in fixed versus random effects. So let me show you what I mean here. So if we have the mean side and the variance side, in other words, I'm saying what fixed effects do you have versus what random effects do you have? If I have an intercept, spell that out here, on each place, what's that called? That combination. Fixed intercept, random intercept. What's it called when you only have a fixed intercept and no other predictors? Empty, yeah, empty means, and more specifically, because it's on the mean side, random intercept only. So you know that one is our starting point. If we pick up a linear time slope as a fixed effect, I then call that fixed linear random intercept to distinguish the fact that each person doesn't yet get a random slope, they only get a random intercept. If I add then the random slope, all I have to call the model is a random time slope, random linear slope model, because the random slope is always phrased as a deviation from the fixed. The U's are always how far off you are from the corresponding fixed effect. Therefore, the fixed effect always stays in the model, even if it's non-significant. So because you always have to have a fixed slope underneath a random slope, it's sufficient to just refer to the, the existence of the random slope in describing what's in the model. Likewise, 
you have to have an intercept underneath every other type of predictor that you would put in, so I don't have to talk about those either. So I would call this combination right here a random linear model versus taking this out, I would call it fixed linear random intercept. What if I did this? What would you call that? Wrong. <laughs> That's what I would call it, wrong. You can't have the U1 for the, how each person gets their own slope without what the thing is the U1 deviates from. The U's, the random effects are phrased as deviations. So the thing it's deviating from is the fixed effect always stays in the model even if it's non-significant. So if this fixed effect is here but non-significant, whereas this linear time slope has a significant variance, that combination gets you this picture on the bottom left. So I would retain the fixed linear time slope even if on average it's non-significant because as I add stuff to the model, it's not going to be exactly zero. It needs to be able to wiggle so that the random slopes can properly be phrased as deviations from them. So if you have a random effect, the fixed effect has to be there already. It is possible to have a fixed effect without a random effect, though. You can have something happen on average and that something can hold to the same extent across people. You can have a fixed without a random. For instance, this picture up here on the top right is perfectly fine. You could have a situation in which there is change on average, but people don't differ in the extent to which they change. That could happen. So my point is, is that in testing each of these things, there's never a point at which it's game over. If you have a fixed effect that's non-significant, you could still have a significant random effect. People could still need their own of it, even though it's zero on average. Vice versa, people could have a significant fixed effect that they all share just fine, or you could have both. So either, neither, or both are perfectly fine. So let me go back then. We're going to pick up the stuff in the middle, don't worry. I just want to get the, the concepts in first. So the thing that we're talking about then that's brand new is this U1 here. That represents the idea of a variance. So how do I know if that thing is significant? Before answering, ask me this. What's the null hypothesis for a variance? Zero. No variance, right? What's the smallest variance you could ever have? No variance, huh? So this idea of a walled test, the idea that you can take two standard errors on either side of a parameter to judge its significance, create a confidence interval, you're going to hit up against a wall, excuse me, this side, this side, where it wants to go negative, but it can't. So whenever you're in that situation where you're trying to test the significance of something where the middle is not zero, Traditional significance test, the stare at the p-value approach, doesn't work. That's where we have to do what instead? I heard it. Transformation. What is it? Transformation? Nope. Model comparisons? Yes, more words. Model comparisons? Hmm? Minus two log likelihood differences? If you're writing that up in a manuscript, what's that called? Starts with an L, abbreviated LRT, likelihood ratio test, yes. It's either a ratio of likelihoods or a difference between log likelihoods. Whenever you're dealing with the log of a number, multiplication becomes addition and division becomes subtraction. So you can think of it as a difference in log likelihood or you can think of it as a ratio of likelihoods but it's called a likelihood ratio test. And what am I looking for? I, in my output, I get a minus two log likelihood. If this random slope variance represented by U1 here for each person 
If that's significant, what should happen to my minus 2 log likelihood? Go down, go up, or stay the same? Go down. Yes, smaller is better. One way to remember that is that uh, the, the quantity minus 2 log likelihood that shows up on your output is often referred to as deviance in other MLM books. So if you think about deviant behavior being something you want to minimize, minus 2 log likelihood is deviance. It's bad for you. Smaller is better. So let's look at the example and show how to add that random slope to the mix. Let me find the other one here. This one. So we were looking at the example from chapter 5, where these are the results from a saturated means unstructured variance model. So the means are plotted in red, the variances are plotted in blue, and what happens is they both go up over time. The, the change in the means over time looks fairly linear. The change in the variance over time looks nonlinear. I would call that either accelerating or bendy or quadratic, something to the uh, some sort of words that convey this idea that it's going up at an increasing rate. So then we looked at the empty model, no, no fixed linear, no random linear. Got an interclass correlation. We added the fixed linear time. Gave each uh, gave a shared slope to everybody, I should say. Now we're ready to do random linear. So equation 5, 5 from chapter 5 is where we get to pick up. So looking at the addition of this u1. So note in the syntax, I have a statement here reminding you about this. Wave versus time. Even if they are literally the same variable, like if you just made a copy of a variable, they do different things. So in this case, wave is 1 to 4. It is being treated as an ID variable. It goes on the repeated line to t tell SAS how to build the R matrix for each person. And because it's on the repeated line, it has to go on the class statement. Those two go together. Time, on the other hand, is wave minus 1, such that it runs from 0 to 3. By putting time in the model line, we are introducing a fixed slope for time. Fixed, everybody gets. The new part, though, is that it shows up on the random line, too. So let's review some letters. Random line refers to level 2 variances or level 1. If each person gets their own intercept and now their own time slope, that has to be two. People are two. What's the letter? Where are those random intercepts and time slope variances going to live? G, R, or V? G, good. Level one then is the residual variance and potentially covariance across time. In this case, we have specified an R matrix at level 1 that has equal variance and no covariance. And then if you put G and R back together, V. I hear that G and R are back together again and going out on tour. I will not be there. I did just find out coming back. I would highly recommend that show. That was fun. Just as an FYI, she's coming in March. Next week, I'm very, very excited because the concert that has been postponed for like three years is now coming, which is Janet Jackson coming to the Sprint Center. Finally, she had a baby at 50, and now she's back on tour. I am so excited. As it turns out, that's what I wanted to be when I grew up, was a backup dancer for Janet Jackson. That was my first <laughs> career. But as it turns out, short people who get dizzy when they spin around, they're not going to have much of a career in dance. So I just have to go in her concerts and, and try and do the hand motions along with them from all her videos. So that's from If, by the way. It's my favorite one. But I digress. 
random linear model. That's what we're talking about here. So here's my letters. R matrix, residual variance is equal across time. G matrix, this one is bigger than we're used to seeing. It now has a two by two dimension to it. So what does that number right here mean? Two by 2.26. Any guesses? If you know that G is level two variance, right? And they actually label the rows and columns. It has something to do with the intercept. That's my random intercept variance. That's my variance of the U0s across people. So that means then, still in the G matrix at 2, 2, that has to be what? Something to do with time. Random time slope variance, yes. That's the variance across the U1s. What is the off diagonal? Yeah, that's a covariance, exactly. Same as what you're used to seeing in the ACS models. That's a covariance between the random intercepts and the random slopes. I can take that covariance and turn it into a correlation. And actually, SAS did that for me here in G-Core. And that provides the correlation between the two. They are un re relatively uncorrelated, meaning that where you are at time zero has little relationship to whether or not you change more or less than everyone else. So that 0.9, does that look like a big number or small? Yeah, the correct answer is, Ugh. how the hell do I know? How do I know if it is significant? Greater than zero. Someone who's currently not chewing, help your classmates out. Several of you are eating lunch, you were excused from responding. Sarah, I'm picking on you. How do I know if that 0.9 is significant? Can I just stare at the p-value? Do I have to do something special? Model. Model comparison. Yeah, that's our friend likelihood ratio test. So what was the minus 2 log likelihood before we put it in the model, and what is it now? Before... 415. Should it go up or down? down? Down. Now it is 366. So yes, that's less. How many parameters did we add to the model by adding our random slope and don't say one? This is a tricky one. It's two. The covariance counts, yes. So in our G matrix here, we added this random linear slope variance, and we added its covariance with the random intercept simultaneously. So we added two terms, not just one. A uh, common question, do we have to add the covariance? Yes. Yes, 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 always. That's what type equals UN means in this context. In our review the other day, we talked about types. And it is on the random line, type equals UN forever and ever, amen. Because what that means is that the G matrix gets to be whatever it wants. It gets to find the best random intercept variance, it gets to find the best random slope variance, and it gets to find the best covariance between them. There does not make any kind of sense to put any other kind of restriction on there. R matrix, that's the one where we have choices. This is a really strict assumption that says that after we give each person their own intercept and slope, then the E's have constant variance over time, and they have no covariance over time. So this VCR matrix that looks like a diagonal there, what we're saying is that the only reason that occasions from the same person was related is because each person needed their own intercept and because they need their own slope. 
those two reasons are why there were person dependency. There was person dependency, why there was a person correlation. After you factor those out, put them over here in the G matrix, what's left looks like this. No covariance, equal variance over time. That's a testable hypothesis. And in uh, chapter five, I go through um, a couple of alternatives, such as having an AR1 or a Topolitz 2 on here that you can use to see if there's any residual correlation. Did I do that in this handout? Yeah, I did. So just for the sake of argument here, I tested that model against one in which I switched the R matrix to be AR1 instead of VC. So then it changes it to look like this, where it estimated an R correlation between adjacent occasions of 0.02 and that minus two log likelihood did not go down, so that's unnecessary. Likewise, I tried a TOPE 2, which means that I have a residual covariance between adjacent occasions only. That didn't help the model fit better either. So those are some alternatives that you could, that you could try. Um, those are more likely to be necessary in really long studies, um, particularly those that have uh, occasions that are relatively close together. All right. So letters, G is level two, right? G is level two. Is that a person thing or a time thing? Level two is person or time? Person. So level two is my random effects, is the ways that people differ from each other, that they live in the G matrix. Level one is my time specific variance, that lives in the R matrix. And when I put them back together again, what letter do I get? V. So that is one of the things that I asked SAS to give me, is what does V look like as well as its correlation version in addition to G and G core? I had also asked for R, so all of those things are not required, but you can ask for it to print them. Now what I want to show you then is a comparison of the answer key model versus this one. So the trends that we noticed in the variances initially. So this up here on the top is my unstructured variance model. The answer key, everything gets to be what it wants. You make this big. What do you notice about these variances over time? They're increasing. They're increasing at sort of an acceleration. Let's look at what the random linear model predicts our V matrix to look like. Our current prediction from the random linear model is on the bottom. Check that out. And you're staring. 2 to 4 to 6 to 11. 2 to 4 to 6 to 11. Boom, drop the mic. As it turns out, the random linear model is what I use to generate these data. So it's not like you know super informative that it fits well because that's like the definition of math. But the point that I want to make though is that that's what random linear time slopes do. They change the variance so it's no longer constant across time. They change the covariance so that it's no longer constant across time. So it's building an arm, a, a V matrix put back together again that's gonna look more like the original data. But it's doing it in a more parsimonious way. So how many parameters did my unstructured variance model take for four occasions? Remember the equation? Number of occasions times number of occasions plus one over two. 10. How many parameters did it take to build this V matrix from my random slope model? One residual variance. One variance and one four. So the question is, did I do just as good a job predicting all 10 terms with only four terms? That's the relevant question. <laughs> Likewise, how many means would I have in a saturated means model? 
for four occasions. Four, yes, no tricks, I swear. I will warn you if I'm gonna trick you. I'm going for like the easy audience participation. Four means in a, in a saturated means model. How many rows are in my fixed effects table here? Two. So the same idea, did my two terms capture those four means well enough? That's the basis of model fit for these models. You can only answer that question if you have balanced data though. If you have a limited set of means to capture and a limited set of possible variances. One of the hallmarks of this random slope model though is that this is perfectly appropriate for unbalanced data as well. So you will see um, in grant proposals and results sections, textbooks, etc. Sometimes people will make what I would call hand wavy statements about these models, like when they're being really unspecific. It's a dead giveaway that they don't know what they're talking about. And so I don't want you to grow up to be one of these people. You ever heard this phrase? MLM handles missing data. MLM handles unbalanced data, right? So what I want to show you is how it does that. How did it come up with a V-matrix that looks like that? And that requires a little bit of matrix stuff to show you. But that's what I want you to understand is how it's going to address this unbalanced and missing data situation because that's what people say the benefit of these models is and they're absolutely right. But it's not enough to just know that that is the case but why it is the case. Okay, all right, one more thing here before we look at that, something a little bit less scary to start with. Random effect confidence intervals. So I asked you a few minutes ago to look at this number here. This is the random slope variance of 0.9 and say, is that big or is that small? It's like, I don't know. Well, now we know it's not zero. We know it's significant, but that doesn't give us any sense of like how big that number is in a, in a describable way. So one option that you have to try and describe how big your variance is, I'll teach you more uh, next week, but the first one here is this idea of a random effects confidence interval. This is not a typical confidence interval. The confidence intervals that show up on the fixed effects tables and the ones you're probably used to hearing about describe the precision of an estimate. Like if it thinks the fixed slope is six across 95% of all samples, like what would it range around six? That's not what this is doing. What this is trying to do is to put the metric of change back into the original scale of the outcome. And it's talking about how much variability the model is predicting across people in that original uh, scale. So you can build these confidence intervals, and you will in your homework four, for every term in your model that has a random effect. If it has a random effect, you know it has to have a fixed effect, because random trumps fixed. Random is the deviation from the fixed effect, so you know that they have to go together. So if you have a random effect, then there's a fixed effect that goes with it. In this current example, we have two. I have an intercept and I have a time slope. Each of those has a fixed part that everybody gets. Each of those has a random deviation from it whose variance we estimate as part of the model. So I have two confidence intervals. The first one is gamma zero zero for the fixed intercept, plus or minus 1.96 if you want to create a 95% confidence interval, times what is the square root of a variance? Think back to intro stat, what is that? Standard deviation, right? So what this is doing is starting as the fixed effect at the center and then trying to figure out what plus or minus two standard deviations around it would be where the standard deviation is defined as the amount of random variance. So if I fill in the numbers from this example, the fixed intercept is 10. That's my expected outcome at time zero on average. Given the size of the random variance around that 10, the random intercept variance 2.26 right here, my 95% confidence interval goes from 7.3 to 13. So that says that in my sample, 95% of the individuals are predicted to have individual intercepts ranging from 7 to 13. 
So if I know what this scale is, that gives me some sense of how big variability is. Does this scale go from like 0 to 1,000? Or does this scale go from like 0 to 15? If I know what my scale is, those numbers then mean something to describe the absolute amount of variation that we're seeing. So these are predictions that can help you convey just how much variability there is in real terms. Likewise, fixed slope, random slope variance. Fixed slope was 1.7. So that is how y changes per unit time. It's positive, so on average, people go up by 1.7 units for every additional unit of time in this example. That was significant. We stared at the p-value. It accounted for 69% of the residual variance, in fact. If I then put in my random slope variance here, work out the confidence interval, although the average rate of change is 1.7, 95% of my sample is predicted to have individual slopes ranging from negative 0.15 all the way up to 3.6. Yes, 95% of my sample is predicted to have individual slopes ranging from negative 0.15 up to 3.6. This is in the back of the chapter five too, I promise. So this is the point at which you really have to make sure if you're gonna do this, that you upfront in your analysis strategy section describe what these things mean. Because I have seen this um, from reviewers, they look at this confidence interval and they go, wait a minute, doesn't that mean that there's no change because it overlaps zero? And if you don't pay attention to what kind of confidence interval it is, that's what it looks like but that is not the case. So how do I answer that person? Dear reviewer three, any ideas? Reviewer three says, the confidence interval for the random slope overlaps zero. Doesn't that mean that there's no change? Step one, apologize. Dear reviewer three, we apologize that we were not sufficiently clear. Because if somebody doesn't understand your paper, that is your fault, always. In the revised version, we have taken care to clarify the interpretation of these confidence intervals. As now discussed on page blah, it means that yeah, some people didn't change. Some people went down a little bit. Some people went up. On average, it went significantly up as indicated by the significance of the fixed slope. So this is especially important in the context of how you talk about change. Sometimes you want to phrase it as, I expect that, say, this group will have a greater increase than this other group. And that would be appropriate if your confidence interval is mostly positive like this one. But what if you have zero slope on average? Then you don't want to talk about more up or less up. You want to talk about this group's going to increase while that group's going to decrease. Decrease more, decrease less, increase more, increase less. Trying to figure out the right words to describe change involves a definition of not only what the average effect is, but then how variable around that average effect do you have here? Does it go in the opposite direction? Because then you can't talk about increases exclusively. Questions on that? Any of that you want to hear again? Sir, in the back, Charlie. Yep. I, I don't know why the default is not unstructured for G. Um, I know that that is the case in every program, though. Um, the default at, for the random statement is VC which actually means no covariances but different variance components. And I think that's because there's another way of specifying these models um, in which that one is OK. Like I've seen it, let me show you. Uh, like in stats books, they write it, if they put in a random intercept, rather than doing it this way, what they do is they would do this. Um, 
person ID. And then that would be, oh uh, goodness. They don't have a type or a subject then. And then it works out to where they have like a giant matrix where the diagonal is held constant across people. So it's, it's a six of one, half a dozen of the other. But when you're specifying it in the way that I'm teaching you where you have your random intercepts and your random slopes on the random line, you have to allow a covariance between them because they came from the same person. And furthermore, um, something we haven't talked about yet is the interpretation of what the random intercept variance means. So let me go back to my pictures here. These bottom two pictures. Uh, let's look at the bottom left here. So the top two pictures show parallel lines, right? They show constant variance over time. They show constant covariance compound symmetry. So in that case, what the random intercept variance would be doesn't matter what time it is. It's, it's constant. It's all the same. But in the bottom two pictures here, what the random intercept variance would be depends on where time zero is. So if time zero is at the beginning, for instance, I will have a smaller number show up for my random intercept variance than if time zero were at the end where it's greater. That covariance is dependent in interpretation and an estimate on where the random intercept is. So you could end up with a completely different number for the covariance, whether it's at time zero or at time three, or where, I mean, when you move the intercept around. So because the intercepts and slopes come from the same sampling unit, and because the covariance is centering specific, it makes sense to keep it in. Um, there is a chapter in the Snyder's and Bosker MLM book. There's a, sub, there's a subheading called, don't force the covariance to be zero in bold exclamation point. So I'm echoing uh, other people's opinions on this topic as well. You can't, you got to keep the covariance in. I do not know why it's not the default. Maybe so that you can all go out and have jobs. Because if you learn to negotiate this shit, someone's going to hire you. I promise. You maybe don't want jobs. I don't know. Mm. I thought you did. At some day, right? Maybe not today, but someday you'd like to, like, you know, pay toilet, buy your toilet paper not on credit, you know, big dreams like that after grad school. I've been there. I've been there. All right. Other questions? Okay. I think I've hit the, the big picture here. So, like I said, I want to show you how this stuff works. And it's involving a little bit of matrices. But the big picture here is I'm trying to differentiate what it means when you have a random intercept only versus when you have a random intercept and a random slope. In this case, a random slope for time. But the same ideas will apply to other kinds of random slopes. So picking up on slide 14 then. So this combination you have seen repeatedly. This is our friend, the random intercept only model, otherwise known as a compound symmetry pattern that it predicts. If I have a G matrix that has only random intercept variance in it, person mean differences right here, U0, and I have an R matrix that has constant variance on the diagonal and no covariance over time, that creates a total pattern in V that says we have constant variance and equal covariance and that the only reason we had covariance across occasions from the same person was because of person mean differences, and that's it. So in terms of, you can talk about it being person dependency or person variation, there's only one kind. People differ in where they are on Y, and you keep that difference all the way through your time series, parallel lines. Several of you noted in your quiz that you can't just add these two matrices together because they're of different sizes, and you're right. And so we'll see in just a second how that happens. So here is another way of thinking about how the model translates into these predictions. So here is my, uh, this is a fixed linear time random intercept model, so we're focusing just on the random part. So here's the combined model. If you want to say, how does this model tell me what the variance would be at any occasion? 
we have this function here. There is no variance in a fixed effect, so those go away. Therefore, all that I have left are these two terms. So this says that irrespective of what time it is, the model predicts that the variance is part u and part e. Likewise, if I want to predict what the covariance is between any two occasions, so I'm building this V matrix through this model, same thing here. I have the covariance is right here for A, comma, B as my two occasions. Because fixed effects don't contribute to the covariance, that stuff all drops. E's have no covariance in this model, so all we're left with is U0. So the covariance of u0 with itself, otherwise known as the variance. So what this is how the model predicts that compound symmetry V matrix. It says, when you work through the algebra, all the variance is part u, part e, and it's constant over time. And the only reason for covariance is this u0 variance, this random intercept variance, this person mean difference variance, and that's it. Here is another way that you will see this in books, and I want to show this to you so that you're not scared by it when you see it like I usually am, because you know this already. This is the matrix version of this written out per person, where we're using capital letters to represent the idea that each term here holds multiple values, either rows or columns. And in this case, we have y for each person is a function of x, which holds the variables that have fixed effects. So in this case, we have a column of ones that represents the fixed intercept. In this model, we also have fixed linear time. So here are some time values for this person. The gamma matrix here holds the fixed effects estimates themselves. And then we have this part here. This is the part in blue that makes this different from what you learned in regression. It's not just e, but we also have these u's shown up. And how the u's show up is as a function of another matrix, and this is the, the, the one that controls which predictors get random effects. So x and z are both matrices of predictors. x holds the ones that have fixed effects, which is 2 here. z holds the one that only has random effects, which is just an intercept. So if you work that through, you end up with how the model says what y should be at each occasion, which is a function of the fixed intercept everybody gets, the fixed slope versus what occasion it is for that person, the random intercept that each person gets their own of, and then a residual, which each person gets a different one for each occasion. These z's then play an important role in forming the V matrix. This form right here Something times a matrix times the something transpose, meaning on its side like this, that just means squared. So you see this formulation in CFA models as well. But what this does then is it says for this particular person, how big does my V matrix have to be? If somebody has all four occasions of data, then they end up with a four by four matrix. What happens if somebody didn't show up that day? You know, they only have three. What do you think they're going to happen to them? Do they still have a four by four? No, they have a three by three. So it is building a customized prediction for each person that takes into account how many observations they have. If they have four, it gets four. If they have five, it's five by five. If they have three, it's three. The same thing happens then when we have a random slope. So we saw this earlier. Unbalanced data, we'll talk about that in just a second. Oh, yeah, I don't like the order in which I did this. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. There we go. I'm on slide 28. We'll come back to the others. I'm going to change that. Twenty-eight. So same thing that we just looked at, now with a random slope. So before, random intercept meant that people differed from each other in one way, mean differences, that's it. Now we have picked up another way people differ from each other, which is in their rates of change over time. Random linear slope shows up in G here. So now, between person has two kinds of variance. 
and a covariance between the random intercepts and slopes, R looks the same as before. And I want to show you then how each person gets a V matrix using these terms. So here's my random linear time model in which, uh oh, damn it, spot the typo. That right here, that's a one. I'd like to say I did that for pedagogical reasons, but the truth is I just screwed up. <laughs> oh well, that should be a one, please fix it. So here's my model up here. If we do the same thing that we did before, how does this model predict variance and covariance? How does this model build me a V matrix? Let's do variance first. Fixed effects drop. So the first step is removing the fixed effects because they don't have variance. Everybody gets the same. Then we take these terms and we FOIL them. We can take time and square it and bring it out of the variance. And we're left with all of this stuff here. You can read in chapter five the algebra to get through this. But the point I want to make though is that this part in blue is new. When we have a random slope, we are saying that the variation over time is partly due to the random intercept and partly due to the residual. Those two are still constant over time, but there's this new part that shows up. More specifically, it is time squared, so the variance at a particular time, what time is it, that time squared, times the random slope variance, plus two times that time times the covariance. Do I expect you to memorize this? Absolutely not. Am I going to ask this of you on a quiz? No. But what I want to make the point, though, is that this model tells you exactly how the variance changes over time. It changes by this function, and it works out to be a quadratic formula. It predicts that the variance changes quadratically over time. There's a point at which it will have a minimum, and it's going to grow on either side of that. It makes a U-shaped prediction. So if I have balanced data, I could plug in time zero, time one, time two, time three, and I get an answer over here as to what the predicted variance is, right? When can't you use an unstructured matrix, do you remember? for the answer key? Unbalanced, right? So we don't have an answer key of the perfect four by four answer if people didn't all come in at the same times. Eh. But can I plug in time equals 1.6 into this formula and get some number? Yeah. Or time equals 1.8 or time equals whatever number. This model predicts a continuous function for how variance changes over time, which means that it can make a different prediction for each possible value of time. That's how it addresses unbalanced data. Rather than saying, I'm gonna have a model that predicts the variances to all be the same, which is compound symmetry, random intercept, or each variance gets its own, which is the heterogeneous variance models we saw last week and the unstructured. This is a middle ground that not only gives different variances over time more parsimoniously, but it also allows you to then interpolate what would the variance be at in between times. So if I look at the answer key model here, for our example, for instance, this is four occasion data. This is my unstructured matrix for my variances and covariances. It takes 10 parameters, you told me. It takes six covariances and four variances to pull this off. But this doesn't tell me what would happen at time three and a half. It can't interpolate because it's treating each unique value as a separate thing. So its prediction capabilities are very limited. Models that invoke random slopes, in contrast, they can predict what the variance would be at any value of time, the ones in between or out into the future. And that's how it handles unbalanced data. 
it's going to build everybody their own custom V matrix based on whatever times they actually have. Next slide 30 does the same thing with the covariances. If you work through the algebra, you get to the bottom here. A random intercept model says the only reason for covariance between two occasions is the random intercept. Once you throw in a random linear slope, you pick up all this stuff, which says the covariance between two occasions depends on which two occasions it is. So it depends on which A and B you're talking about as your two occasions, and it depends on what it thinks the covariance between the intercept and slope is and the variance for the slope. So again, time-specific predictions that can interpolate between intermediate values. So in this slide, we pick up a new column right here. Everything else is the same except this Z matrix, which is the predictors that get random effects now has two columns, one for the random intercept, one for the random time slope. On slide 32 here then, we wrap that Z matrix around G like this and build a custom V matrix for each person that not only has as many rows and columns as they have data points to be predicted in the outcome, but also keeping in mind which exact times they have. It's custom. So this is what it would look like, for instance, if I have predictions for two people simultaneously. And this is actually how these models are estimated in SAS. It builds a ginormous V matrix for the entire sample simultaneously in this, this is called block diagonal, where it's like stuff, 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 stuff with zeros elsewhere in a pattern. So here is the first section here. This is somebody who came in when they were supposed to, time zero, one, two, three, hooray. The second half of this is what it would look like for somebody who came in when they were not supposed to. Now they came in all four times, but they came in off cycle. The same random intercept and slope variances and their covariance are used for both of these people, but the wraparound function keeps track of which times were actually observed. So the end result would be that the V matrix for this top person looks different than the V matrix for this bottom person because it's constituted with different times. Now you'll notice between the two people, there's piles of zeros everywhere in the off chunks of the diagonal. Do you know why that is? Does the model have anything in it that would account for dependency between persons? Like people from the same family or people from the same school or anything like that? Not yet. All we've been talking about is the correlation of occasions from the same person. This model says people are independent. Does it have to be that way? Nope. If people are from the same group, they would pick up an extra term that then changes these off diagonal chunks into some kind of correlation for people that come from the same group. And then groups would be independent. So you can build whatever custom pattern matches your sampling. For somebody who has unbalanced data and missed an occasion. That's the bottom person here. Their V matrix and all of the corresponding pieces here, it would just be a three by three instead of a four by four. So putting it together. From a research question testing point of view, we are trying to figure out all the ways in which people differ from each other. Do they differ in intercept? Do they also differ in rates of change? That then guides further hypothesis testing because they have to differ in rates of change before it would make sense to predict those differences with other predictors of interest, people things. What that is doing behind the scenes 
is creating a V matrix that has some intermediary here between everything's the same, uh, compound symmetry, and everything gets to be what it wants, but we can't then interpolate between these specific values. Random slopes give you something in the middle that's more parsimonious, but also inter interpolable. Is that a word? Interpolatable? Anyone? Come on, linguistics people. Help me out. Interpolable? Is that a word? I, I want, I want interp, I want like, fills in the dots in between the line. That's what I'm going for. Not, interpretable would also work, but that's not the word I want. I'll have to work on it. Yeah. Can you tell that my verbal GRE scores were maybe not the greatest? But that's OK, because I learned how to do this shit, and I got a job. And so will you. That's my take home message. So yes, we're predicting patterns. In the same way that we said AR1 looks like this, and topolitz looks like this, and unstructured looks like this, Adding random slopes gives you new patterns, but they are time-specific patterns, continuous functions that allow you to make a prediction for any one set of time observations, even if they're not the same, and even if they're not all there. Duh. Drop the mic. I don't want to drop my, my soda, though. There's nowhere in this building that sells Diet Mountain Dew, so I had to bring in my own. So I know that that's a, a little heavy-duty stuff, but I want to be able to uh, allow you to translate and give some answer to the question, how do these models handle missing data? How do they handle unbalance? The answer is you give each person their own customized prediction. They don't all have to share the same prediction. That's how. Whew. Other questions? So we have just a couple minutes left. I want to go back and hit something that I skipped over because this is a question you'll also get. So how are these models handling dependency? Dependency is correlation. We started here. This is slide 24. Once upon a time, there was an E, and it was all in one pile. That was the world of regression. First thing we did was split E into level one versus level two. So then we have two piles of variance. We are now talking about splitting E again. Random linear slope variance comes out of level one residual. So if you think about the idea that people change differently, Let's go this picture right here. If I had given this blue person the same line as the black line, the line for the mean sample, would their E variance be bigger or smaller? E variance, residual variance, deviations from the line. They'd be bigger because I gave them the wrong line. Their line needs a slope of 8. If I gave them a line with a slope of 6, their data points are going to be further off than they would be otherwise. So you can think about this idea that part of the reason you had residual variance is that people need their own lines. So that variation comes out of what we would call E and becomes level 2. Now, can I use the word explained or accounted for here in talking about what the random slope does? Does it account for variance? This is a tricky one. No. I have reallocated what I used to call level one residual variance into a new pile of variance at level two, which is person time slope variance. It's still error, though, in the sense that I don't know why my blue person needed a slope of eight, whereas everyone else needed a six. It's still unexplained. It's just attributable to a source. More generally, this idea that we're going to take variance piles out of E and attribute them to a source, that's how the entire world of multi-level works. Next week, we're going to talk about quadratics, quadratic effects of time. If I give each person their own quadratic effect of time in addition to linear, 
Where do you think that variance is going to come from? E still. Why were you off your line? Well, because I made you share the same bendy line as everyone else, and you need your own bendy line. That will reduce the residual variance and attribute the variance to a new level two component. So we then have three ways people differ from each other, not just two. Same here with the person variance. If these people were actually nested in schools, to build a three-level model, I would take that person variance and split it in what, into what is actually between schools versus within schools. And I could do the same thing to the person slope. I could split it into what is between schools and within schools. So this idea of just taking variance and splitting it into new piles attributable to different sources, that's all this is. Sir, in the back. Nope. In terms of uh, what the estimates would be, maybe, but their standard errors, no. Because what happens every time you split is that the predictor gets tested against whichever piles of variance are relevant for it. So in this case, if I had a predictor of why people needed their own intercepts, what's relevant is the random intercept variance and the residual. Residual is always in there. But the random slope variance gets sort of put to the side, and it doesn't contribute to the standard error because it's irrelevant. If I had a predictor of why people need their own slopes, it'd be the opposite. We would use the random linear slope variance in the error term and the residual, but not the intercept because that's irrelevant. So the standard errors are going to be based on like what is the level the predictor is at and what kind of variance is relevant for that effect. So it very much will differ from a regular regression model in that regard. OK, it's 2.30, and it's fall break next week. So enjoy your two days off, and I will see you on Wednesday. <laughs>